Oh, that's good. Now, to be honest, yes, this is decaf, but it's because I'm gonna be holding this through this entire video because I like a hot beverage on a cold day. If you wanna know about how to grow a strong set of glutes, and this video is gonna take you through that. Really wanna make sure that you get the most out of this video. Be sure to follow me on Instagram because I always post helpful tips and tricks on there for your nutrition and fitness. Now, let's get into it. I started to record this earlier and then the entire complex where we live decided to have leaf blowers going. This is the last time I'm going to film this. Your goal is to grow your booty. Now, these are six steps that you gotta follow if you actually wanna grow a strong set of buns. Please do not skip around this video. The reason why is because they are in a specific order. If you skip around and jump right to the end or jump to the exercises, you're not really gonna know the exact playbook to make sure that you have the results that you're after. The first thing we're gonna cover is to do this. The two things that are most important is that you are lifting heavy weight and that you are fueling properly to grow muscles. Now, if you have no idea what I am talking about, you can go in the show notes and you can click and enter your email address and you'll get a full uh, nutrition guide. It's super in-depth. It's all my best tips and tricks that all my clients use. So do that and it will help explain and color in some of the detail around the nutrition stuff. Number one, when it comes to strength training, we need to make sure we're actually lifting weight. If you want to grow muscles, it requires you to actually stress the muscle with adequate load to make that happen. If you're following Instagram models on social media telling you that they grew their booty by using resistance bands, they're not telling you the truth. You're not gonna see the results that you're after. Using adequate load will help you. Number two, if you are not properly eating enough or eating the proper nutrients to have muscle growth, then you're not gonna see what you want. You only spend so much time in the gym. There are so many other factors that affect your ability to grow muscle. Things like sleep, things like stress levels, things like what you are eating, okay? Glad we got that out of the way. Number two, you need to eat protein. If you're not eating protein, you are not going to have results you are after. That's like my new catchphrase. Results you are after. You're not going to be able to grow a strong set of glutes. Maybe you do think you eat adequate protein. Chances are you don't. Most people aren't eating as much as they think they are, but they're eating more fat and carbohydrates which is why they're in a calorie surplus, which is why most people gain weight. So when it comes to protein, to determine how much you should be having, technically, everything usually that you'll find online will be in kilograms. So not pounds, kilos, but I don't like converting things, so I'm gonna keep things easy. And if you need to convert your weight to uh, pounds from kilos, I'm sorry. That's what you're gonna have to do. My video, my rules. What you can actually do is you could take your goal body weight, so goal body weight, and multiply it times one, and that will give you your protein goal in grams. You might be saying, wow, that's a lot of protein. It is, right? So being at the higher end is technically going to be optimizing muscle gain, muscle growth, uh, because protein helps with muscle preservation, which is important during a fat loss phase. Um, it helps with protein synthesis, which is what allows us to grow our muscle after a hard training session. It helps with recovery between training sessions, and it helps us stay full between meals because it takes time to digest. We want to make sure that we are eating enough of it. Now, do you need to be having like 250 grams of protein per day? Probably not if you weigh 250 pounds. But what you can go towards is you can lower it down. So you can have like a protein range of 0.7 to one. So you can do goal body weight times 0.7 and that will also give you your protein goal in grams. You can then have a range. So the bottom of that range would be 0.7. The top of that range would be one. That's kind of how you can look at it. And another thing you can consider is like some days you're going to be over, some days you're going to be under. As long as you're within like a 10 gram plus or minus range, you're going to be fine. But the important thing here is you have to prioritize it, which means you're going to have to plan for it, right? So if you have 
if you have a protein goal, you're hitting your protein goal, you're going to be moving towards the right direction. You're going to be stepping in the right direction. If you have no idea what I am talking about here, in the show notes, I also have a link to my weight loss calculator. It's one of the best out there. Uh, I'm just, maybe I'm a little biased towards it, but you can download that. It'll be pretty helpful for you too. Number three, diet before the diet. Diet before the diet. Diet before the diet. Now, what the fuck am I talking about? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about two different individuals because right now we're talking about muscle gain, right? We're talking about building our glutes, which are muscle, which require us to gain muscle, which can affect what the scale says, which might make you upset. If you're gaining muscle, the scale will go up. The important thing here is let's look at example one, which is someone uh, who was once very overweight, lost a lot of weight, but the way they lost the weight was by doing a lot of cardio. So now what they have is they don't have much muscle mass at all, right? They don't have a lot of muscle mass. They, they still technically have, they, they might still have uh, body fat, right? And the other category would be someone who is relatively lean, has been lean most of their life, but hasn't been athletic whatsoever, has never strength trained, has never done cardio. They would fall into the category of what we would call skinny fat. That's just the term that we use, right? There's no muscle mass. And like, we might look at that person and might say, wow, okay, maybe they're only like 10, 10 to 12% body fat. But in reality, there's actually a lot more that, that leads us towards this understanding that we need to build some muscle. Now, building muscle requires someone to eat at maintenance or slightly above maintenance. If you are someone who is in the skinny fat category, because you've probably tried dieting before. You probably tried like losing weight by being in a low calorie deficit and maybe you did, but now you're in the situation where you don't have that toned muscular look that you're after. Everyone chases, but they decide to go into a diet to be able to do it when that's actually the opposite. If you are in this category of someone who has little to no lean muscle mass and who is already like kind of in that skinny realm. So being in calorie maintenance, is going to allow you to eat more than you've probably been eating. But if we prioritize strength training and lifting adequate load, you're going to build muscle. When you build that muscle over time, I'm not talking overnight. I'm not talking like one month, two months. What I'm actually talking about is probably closer to like, you know, six, 12 months. If you take that time to actually build that muscle, and if you're new to training, you will see muscle gain pretty fast because of newbie gains. You're doing a new stimulus to your body. You'll gain muscle pretty fast. We want to make sure that we are fueling ourselves properly for that. So eating closer to maintenance calories is going to be helpful. Now, how the heck do you figure out what your maintenance calories are? Glad you asked. Maintenance calories, uh, the, the scientific way you could do it technically uh, would be you would track your calories for about two weeks as accurately as possible. I'm talking about weighing and measuring your food, um, using cups, tablespoons, teaspoons, and a food scale. Weigh it as accurately as possible. Measure things as accurately as possible. Use my fitness pal, use macro, macros first, whatever app you want to use, and track that. That's step number one. Step number two, for two weeks, you are going to weigh yourself daily. Daily weigh-ins, right? This is very important because the scale is going to move around. Don't give a fuck that it moves around. And neither should you because the reality is single days aren't what make or break someone in a muscle gain or a fat loss phase. Like it's, it's just, it's not. What actually matters is on the whole, our weekly average. Weekly averages over time will create a trend. All we care about, depending on the person, is a trend up or a trend down, right? That's what we need to consider. So if you take your calories, for week one, add it up and divide it by seven. That will give you your weekly calorie average. And then you do the same thing for week two. Then you can see, okay, our calories are kind of sitting around here. And then you look at your weight and you take your weekly average. If your weight really hasn't moved much at all or is the exact same, like that average is the same, then you know you're in calorie maintenance. If you see your scale weight go up, like your average weight goes up by like half a pound, 
uh, 0.8 pound, then you know you're in a slight surplus, right? So that's how you can kind of figure it out that way. Do up, uh, and this is going to get crowded here. You can actually do, I'm going to write CM for calorie maintenance. You can actually do uh, current body weight. So your, your current body weight. So I'll just write body weight times 15. And that will give you your maintenance calories. So maintenance M. So you could do that actually to figure out what your maintenance calories would be. Here's the crazy thing about this. It's an estimate. No matter what calorie calculator you use, whether you click below in the show notes and drop your email and get my calorie calculator, it does not matter if you use that one, if you use any other one on the internet. It's all a estimate. So that does not mean that it's for sure, right? But what it does mean is you can do that see what you find, experiment a little bit, make adjustments. That's really what nutrition is. It's all about making adjustments. There's no such thing as the perfect plan because every single human, you're a human, is different. So we have calorie maintenance. We could do body weight times 15, or you could try the two weeks of tracking, two weeks of daily weigh-ins and finding the average. And that will let you know if you're in a calorie surplus, calorie maintenance, or a deficit. If you were someone who was um, new to strength training, I would suggest being at calorie maintenance, sticking there and just focusing on your training, focusing on your sleep, focusing on your stress, focusing on your daily activity levels, like step count, things of that nature. That is for the person who is redeemed skinny fat. Now, for someone who is relatively obese or overweight, let's say it is someone who's five foot seven and weighs 255 pounds. The last thing I would do for that person is put them in a calorie surplus. Because if anything, they're most likely in a calorie surplus and that's why they have been slowly gaining weight. It's not that you gain weight overnight, it's that over time you gain that weight and it might be a slow process. So for that person, we're not gonna put them in a calorie surplus, right? What we can actually do <clears throat> is because like there's newbie gains for training, there's also newbie losses. Someone at that size could actually be put in a relatively small deficit and lose a large amount of weight, right? Why is that possible? Well, if someone's normally eating 4,000 calories a day, let's say they're not aware they're eating that much or even they know they're eating that much, and you put them in a 3,500 calorie deficit and they're able to actually hit that or be at that or most likely what will happen, they'll see that and they'll eat slightly below that because they're tracking now and being aware, you'll see them lose weight pretty fast a lot of that initial weight loss is water weight, right? That's what we're losing there. But then fat starts to go. And at a certain point, like newbie gains phase, fade, you will plateau with weight loss as well. What we need to consider with this is I would put someone either at maintenance for a little bit, whether it be like the first month, right? I usually do about one month at maintenance or what we could deem as like estimated maintenance because most likely when someone has that number, they're more likely to then be in a deficit because it's going to be closer to what they need. And then we're going to also increase their daily step count, uh, get that up to like 7,500 or more, <clears throat> depending on the person. It might take more time to get there. And we're also going to be strength training. And we're also going to look at like what builds a nutrition plan. And again, if you don't know what that should look like, you can click that link below and get my ultimate fat loss guide. But again, the big thing here that you consider with all of that the equation you can use. There's so many out there. You can use any calculator out there. Again, my fat loss calculator will show you, but really what it is to give yourself a calorie range. So you would do goal body weight, goal body weight times 12. And that will give you your calorie deficit. Now the next step from there, I would say add 100 and subtract 100 for a calorie range. Calorie ranges are going to work a lot better than one singular number. A range, some days you'll be under, some days you'll be over. This is more realistic for a lot of people. It makes it less overwhelming. So you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, what if I, what if I weigh 300 pounds and I wanna be 150 pounds? I say actually start off with your goal body weight. Goal body weight times 12. It's gonna be a big deficit, but here's the thing, you'll actually be quite all right because your body has fat on it that it will be using for fuel and burning at the same time while you're hitting your protein, hitting your steps, hitting your strength training. That's why someone in this situation will have what we call 
uh, well, actually anyone, what everyone is after is what we call body recomposition, and that's losing fat and building muscle, right? But it's really hard to do those two things at the same time. That's why if someone comes to me and says, build muscle, and then they also say that they really want a six pack, well, you're saying two different things. We have to clarify that, right? You have to be aware. If you want to build muscle, you're going to need to be in a slight either at maintenance or slight surplus. If you want to see your six pack, well, that requires you to get your body fat for men could be anywhere down below 10% uh, body fat for women, you know, closer to like 15%, like that, that's the range you would be to see that. You can't go there right away because what you'll see is maybe a picture like this where someone is just like super skinny. Oh, wait, that's a picture of me from when I was in high school. But that's the whole idea. We need to understand that you have to depend, it depends on where you are in your journey. So what I would recommend is for someone who has a lot of weight to lose, going right to their deficit. For someone who is what we'll deem skinny fat or very lean without any musculature at, at much at all, I would suggest being at calorie maintenance with a slight surplus once you're consistent with it and to focus on prioritizing strength training. Now, you might be saying, this sounds like a lot. Well, it is. Even for anyone who is doing this, there is a, if you're in a surplus or even if you're in a deficit, you could have diet fatigue. Diet fatigue is when you're doing this for a long period of time. Yes, for certain people who are trying to gain weight or put on muscle by being in a slight surplus, it can be a lot to try to eat that much eat past the point of being full on a consistent basis. And for someone in a deficit, it could be quite a lot to be eating less than you want to be eating all the time, right? So that's why we look at the diet before the diet called nutritional periodization. What is periodization? I'm glad you asked. So from a training standpoint, periodization just means having different phases within your training so that you don't burn yourself out right? So that you can be in peak performance for a specific athletic event. We take that same idea of periodization and apply it to your nutrition, right? Now, what, this usually is given in an example of someone who's like a physique competitor or a bodybuilder, right? They have different phases. They might go into a year-long bulking phase when they're in a calorie surplus to put on as much muscle as they can, but they also might gain quite a bit of fat because they don't really care. They're just trying to build that muscle. They're going to sit around. They're going to be uncomfortable. It's okay, right? And then when it comes to season for, for their next show, they will then go into a deficit. Now, if they're far enough out, they could do it slow and steady. It's really, really hard and not the healthiest choice. However, that's what physique competitors do. You're not one of those. I'm not one of those. I don't work with anyone who's that. We can borrow the concept of nutritional periodization, which is the idea that it's like a cycle. And I'm going to have an image right here that pops up and says, it's like a cycle. You have your calorie maintenance, is, and that's where most people will start. That's where I start people. Um, and you focus on you focus on strength training and and some sustainable cardio in there zone 2 cardio right things that can help with your heart health and your overall recovery and your sleep and then after a few maybe maybe it's a four week phase at maintenance maybe it's uh 2 months right it depends on the person you then move into your calorie deficit right you move into this like fat loss phase. Is it an aggressive deficit? Probably not. It's something more sustainable. And we do that for a while. And then and then we go back to maintenance. Because the thing is, a lot of people lose a, a shit ton of weight, and then they have no idea how to maintain that. So then they gain it back. And the way they lose all that weight is being in a big calorie deficit that's very aggressive. But we want to think about long term to sustain what we're doing. So going back to maintenance, focusing on continuing to build muscle, lifting hot, lifting heavy, adequate amount of loads, having proper recovery, all of those things. And then we go into another deficit, right? And then during that mini cut, that's when we might see our muscles pop. We might be able to see that toned look we're after. And then you can decide, do I want to stick around here? Is that a sustainable size for me to do? I, do I want to go into a bulk? Do I want to go into a muscle toning phase, right? Muscle building phase, right? It depends. But the whole idea is you are always moving. You are not just staying in one place forever. We are not trying to lose weight forever. We don't want to diet forever. 
hit our goal, we want to understand and learn a little bit more about ourselves and what's actually sustainable for us. Because your goal in life is not to always be in a diet. That's not. That's not what I want for you. So if you take one thing away from this video, besides the fact that like, I, you know, you can learn a lot from the fat loss guide that you can click on. It's that I don't want you to have to be dieting forever. There are different dieting practices you could do, you know, and there are other examples we can go into. Maybe I'll do another video on that. Do me a favor, comment below and tell me if you want me to do a video on the different types of, of uh, calorie, we'll say calorie cycling, calorie styles, deficits that you could do for your specific goals. You want to see? I'll do it. Give a thumbs up. The fourth one. Now, this is the important one. This is the one that most people skip out on. This is the one that I've brought up several times. Prep heavy stuff. You need to make sure that you are lifting heavy enough weight. Now, what do I mean by this? Progressive overload. That is how we actually build muscle. What is progressive overload? It's a way that we, over time, stress the muscle. And when it gets easier, we continue to stress the muscle, progressive overload. Um, the old example of this, like the oldest one, I think, is I think one of the first Olympians, uh, and his name escapes me. Maybe I will update in the show notes, probably won't. Um, but the way he trained to get ready for, for the Olympics was he had a small, small cow, small cow or calf, and he would carry that cow or calf on his shoulders. And as the calf grew to be bigger, he would continue doing that. And he continued doing that the whole time while this animal grew. He got stronger in the process. That is quite literally progressive overload. So if we look at it in training, you might be used to doing something like three by 10 all the time, right? If you follow some carbon copy training plan, it's three by 10 every time. Um, and let's say we're doing some some deadlifts. So you're doing three sets of 10 repetitions of dead, deadlifts, and you choose to use 35 pounds. So the first session, you could do three sets of 10. The second session, you could do three sets of 12, right, with that same weight. The third session, you could do three sets of 15 with the same weight. The fourth set, you could do three sets of 15. You're improving your endurance basically at that point. You're not really challenging the muscle. What we might actually want to do is we would look at something like instead of just three sets of 10, there's a whole rep range or rep scheme, but anywhere from like between six up to like 12 reps can be considered hypertrophy, hypertrophic. It could be muscle building. So in actuality, between six to 12 reps is a sweet spot where we want to make sure that we're actually challenging ourselves for that. I have a whole article on that. I'll link to that below, like how to strength train, like strength training, getting started with it. It's a beginner's guide. It's really helpful. Check it out. Um, but the idea is we want to have that progressive overload happen. This is done through periodization, which we talked about, different phases in a training plan, but it's also done through our our load that we are lifting and the rep scheme that we are using. One of the things I love to do for my clients um, and how I program for myself is doing something like a double progression. So a double progression would be something like this. We keep our sets the same, so like three sets. And instead of just three sets of 10, it might be three sets of six to 10 repetitions or six to eight repetitions, right? So what that actually looks like is for my deadlift, the first week, because you're stronger than you think you are, you're going to be deadlifting 100, 100 pounds, right? First set at 100 pounds, you get six reps. Your second set at 100 pounds, you get five reps. Your third set at 100 pounds, you get five reps. Okay, so three, uh, six, five, five. Great. The following week, you'll stick at 100 pounds because you didn't max out. You didn't hit those eight reps for all the sets. So then you get uh, the first set, you get six reps. The second set, you get six reps. The third set, you get seven reps. Okay, you're sticking with that weight. And then by the fourth week, you're doing uh, the first set, you get eight. The second set, you get eight. The third set, you get eight. The progressive overload would be you would then increase the weight to, let's say, 100 and, 115 pounds, and you would start the next cycle at three by six to eight, right? That's progressive overload. That's what we want to make sure that we have that. We are lifting 
adequate loads in doing that. The other way that we can affect muscle growth is making sure that we are training in the lengthened position. So for example, basically where you feel that stretched position in the muscle. So if you are performing, I'm gonna do some artwork here, and you'll see some of these in the exercises later. If you were performing something like a deadlift, the way we perform the deadlift, here's your head, here's your butt, here are your, here's your knees, right? And here's your leg. Like this is not a great deadlift right here, right? We might want something more like this. And then your knee and then there. Okay, so either way. This, this is our deadlift position, and we got our arms on a bar, right? We're, we're not very far away. We're doing an RDL, okay? Romanian deadlift. We have a slight bend in our knee, and we have a vertical shin. And then our hips go back. This is better. And then here we are with our butt. This position, where we are in this position, when the dumbbell gets to be about mid-shin, you're going to feel a big stretch through your hamstring and through your glutes. That is the stretched position. Having time under tension in the stretched position is a great way to stimulate muscle growth. In fact, you want to have that time under tension in the stretched position for most lifts that you are doing. If we are just moving through things fast, there's a time and a place for that, but that's not probably the best route for the muscle growth that you are after. So doing something like deadlifting and manipulating your tempo, right? So that you would be paused in that deadlift at the bottom in that stretch position for like a three count and a slow three count, like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three. Well, you're going to be very sore later, but you're also going to stimulate that muscle growth specifically for the glutes and for the hamstrings. Um, you can also play around with doing something like slow eccentrics, another way to really take on more weight, right? In a slow eccentric is that lowering phase or the down phase. You can take on more load a heavier weight in that phase that, and it will always be a challenge to get back up. So for example, you can squat down with way more weight on your back, but it's always a struggle to get back up. It's doing something like a slow eccentric with adequate load for an RDL. And then you pause at the bottom for three seconds and come back up. That's a lot of time under tension that stimulates muscle growth. So those are just a few lessons. And again, you can get more from that article. It's linked below. You can click and check it out. You might want to skip right, you might want to go to five, but I'm going to call an audible here. We're going to have this. Five is all the exercises that I think you should be having in your leg day programming or your lower body programming if you want to be grow growing a glorious uh, rump. But the thing that you need to consider is there's an entire article that you can read all about this, breaking it down for you too, with little step-by-step -step stuff. That's probably where you're watching this video, but just you're going to have the exercise, so hold your horses. Number six, this is the most important one for anyone trying to do anything in this realm. You need to have patience. You need to be patient. All right, that's not something that everyone wants to hear, but I kind of referenced it before. If you're trying to build muscle, that's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It could take a year. It could take two years. It could take three years. But that's the thing. Everyone wants instant, right? You think that it should happen right now, right away. But usually when you pick the thing that provides you or you think will provide you with instant results, they don't last, right? That's like the person who says they're going to go work out seven days a week. They try it for a week, and then by day eight, they're like, no, nah, not for me. Right? That, that's usually what happens. So what we want to do is we want to find the sustainable thing. Right? We have to have patience, and we also have to stop going for the A+. Plus, right? Perfectionists are just really good at quitting things. I don't want that for you. I want you to be someone who's just more focused on consistency. What can I do that allows me to be consistent? What can I do that allows me to hit like 80% consistency with my nutrition and my training and has 20% where life happens? A B minus is still passing. That's what you need to understand about this. So quick recap, you are going to focus on lifting heavy things. You're going to focus on strength training and focus on your nutrition. You're going to eat adequate amounts of protein, 
and you can see the breakdown here. You are going to diet before the diet. You are going to consider where you are in your, in your body cycle right now. Are you someone who is relatively very skinny without much muscle mass, right? Or someone who lost a lot of weight only doing cardio and doesn't have a lot of muscle mass? Or are you someone who is overweight who needs to focus on their fat loss and wants to build muscle? Because in that case, you could do both at the same time when you're someone in that category because your body has enough fat to use for fuel as well. Um, and then you need to focus on lifting heavy stuff. Focus on progressive overload. Focus on using the proper exercises, which you will see in a couple seconds. And you need to have fucking patience. You need to be patient. It's so important. Please be patient. Don't rush. I've been personally working out for almost 16 years now, and I am always learning something. I am always working towards something. You, when I cross the finish line, it will be when my time here on this earth is done. So it's a long game. So don't rush it. Stay in it. Stay with it. Now I'm going to do something. I'm going to like snap and it's going to take us to the exercises. So I'm going to snap. One of the best exercises you could do to grow your glutes would be the RDL. Now the Romanian deadlift targets your hamstrings and your glutes, right? And the traditional deadlift, you set up with a bell or a barbell. We're using kettlebells in this example. Uh, between your feet, you would push your butt back as if you're trying to close the car door behind you. You would push your butt back, you would wrap your hands around the bell, you'd have your shins be slightly forward, you'd squeeze an imaginary orange under your armpits as you bend that bell, and then you'd stand up, and you would put the bell back down, right? You would have an easier time getting to the ground. What we're doing is an RDL. An RDL is different because instead of allowing our shins to travel forward, we're gonna bias the hamstrings and the glutes by having a slight bend in the knee, a slight bend versus allowing it to travel forward, and by focusing on pushing my butt back as far as I can. So I'm keeping that vertical shin, pushing my butt back as far as I can. I'm pausing. When you pause, if you're doing it right, you'll feel a big stretch through that hamstring and into your glute. From there, you can drive through your feet to stand tall. Again, it's still the act of closing that car door with your butt, but I'm keeping my shins vertical. Now the limiting factor here will be your hamstring flexibility and your, and your hip mobility, right? So if you're not very flexible, you might only get here, right? But the, in time, you'd wanna be able to work to lower yourself. When I lower myself, I'm not gonna to touch the bell on the ground. So I drive my hips back, push those hips back, keep the shins vertical, boom, right about there, I feel a big stretch, and then I come back up. The dead stop single leg RDL is a fantastic way to develop power, strength, and really to target your glutes. Now, because we are targeting our glutes and we're not necessarily focusing 100% on our balance, if you have a hard time balancing, you can hold on to something like a wall, a squat rack, uh, a bench in front of you, something for stability. Um, I'm gonna try to show without holding on to something, but if I need to grab, just that's why. I'm setting up here, the bell would be inside that leg. And then I would simply just reach back, grab the bell, stand up tall, bring that bell all the way back down till it taps, drive up to stand tall, really pushing that butt back, keeping my foot flexed, not letting it turn out, keep it in. You could also do this if you need a little more stability, but I like that leg out, drive up, come all the way down, tap, up. I just showed you an RDL. So now what we're looking at is a sumo deadlift. Sumo deadlift, our feet, instead of being about hip width apart, are going to move out. Now, how far out? Depends on you. You'll find that it's, you can lift more weight with this variation because you don't have as far to travel, but also you'll find that you really, really, really hit your glutes. Um, just because you have to pull those knees back, it engages it. So this is my setup here. I'm gonna do this with this bell. I'm going to show you two variations. It's just your standard sumo deadlift. So for this sumo deadlift, I chop my hips, I come down, I have my knees, they travel slightly forward, stand up, squeeze at the top, back down, stand up, back down, right? That's the first variation, a sumo Romanian deadlift, a sumo RDL. So I'm here, I'm going to drive my hips back, push my hips back as far as I can. You can see from here, I'm not touching the ground. 
as far back as I can. When I can't go any further, come back up. Drive those hips back. The hips drive back. We try to keep those shins vertical. Stand back up. Again, push the butt back to close that car door. Don't let the arms travel forward. Keep it right under you. Stand up. And this sumo RDL is something you might not traditionally do, but it is a great move for overall athletic performance and overall getting those glutes and improving your range of motion. A more dynamic version of the deadlift, which would be the kettlebell swing. It's an advanced movement, right? The, the, I, I have a tutorial video on it. You can find it. You just click on my profile. You see a video in there. It's a walkthrough of how to lead up to the kettlebell swing, but kettlebell swing is a great way to overall develop glutes and hamstring and endurance and strength and power, right? There's a whole bunch there. But if I'm going to, I would hike the bell back, drive the legs up, stand tall. Doing this action really engages the glutes. Great for overall athletic development. Highly suggest incorporating the kettlebell swing. Now it's not your traditional step up where you see someone come up and tap their leg, go as fast as they can. No, what we're looking to do is actually develop our leg strength. So this is the block that I'm going to be using. Ideally, this would be about the height. You could go a little bit higher depending on your flexibility, um, but like about bench height would be good. I don't have a bench here, so this is what I'm using. You would have two dumbbells in your hand or you could have a single dumbbell on the same side as that leg uh, that you are working. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna hold here to demonstrate, but you would shift your weight forward, drive to stand tall, right? So now I'm up. And then the traditional thing is just to step down really fast and kind of get through it. But we want to focus on the eccentric portion of this. Now, you can use your stairs to do this. It's, it's really, you can practice this anywhere. But the idea is to load your glutes as much as possible as you lower yourself. So if you're using it with external load, you could probably go heavier than you actually think. The only challenging part is getting back up. So don't go super heavy. Um, so again, I'm here. I could have my weight in this arm. I could be holding on to something, right? But the idea is I want to load my glute as much as possible and then come back up. I don't want to necessarily lock out. What I want to do is tuck that hip. So again, I'm loading my glute as much as possible. Tap, back up. Time under tension. So I'll show you from this, uh, this leg. So the act of shifting my weight back, pushing my butt back as far as I can, tapping that toe, light. I'm not putting all my weight. I'm keeping the tension in that glute. Woo, you'll feel that later. Trust me. Single leg glute bridge. Now your traditional glute bridge is just going to have you come up like this, which can be a great starting point. But if you really want to take it up a notch, what you can focus on is the single leg glute bridge. So I bring one leg up to 90 degrees. I like to have my heel driving into the ground and just drive up and come down. Now to create some more time under tension, could add a couple second pause at the top and then come down. You could also do 1.5 rep, right? You could also add further tension by driving that knee into your hand, which just takes things up a little bit more. So I have that full tension across my midsection as well. I don't have a bench in my house, so I tend to do hip thrusts, which is the next movement we're gonna talk about. Using a couch, using a bench. Uh, this tends to be the thing that works well for me. I am not the biggest fan of the traditional hip thrust. The only reason why is because it's always annoying to load up the bar with all the weight possible, and then you also need to worry about like having a pad there. It's a great exercise though to build your glutes, and I'll show you another alternative. So you're gonna set up with your upper back against the uh, chair, wherever you might be. And then the big thing is you wanna make sure that your legs aren't too close, and you wanna make sure they're not too far away. You want a happy medium almost think about making like an M with your body. Then when you drive up through your hips, I want you to think about tucking your hips towards the sky. This will activate those glutes a little bit more. We don't want to hyperextend up here. We want to be happy medium and we want to make sure that our leg is making a 90 degree angle. Depending on your flexibility or the height you're going, you might not be able to touch your butt back down on the ground because you'll be arching through your lower back. I want you to make sure that you try to pull your belly button towards your spine the whole time so you have that nice position. So you come back up, pause, come back down. 
The option that I usually prefer though, because you can do a body weight and it's so tough, or you can add some weight if you wanna make your life miserable with the single leg version, which is, I'll keep my leg exactly where it was as if I was performing my hip thrust. I'm then going to take that leg off the ground towards like 90 degree angle, and then I'm gonna drive up, same thing, pull those ribs down, come down, back up. So this is a single leg hip thrust. Now the thing that people don't actually understand is you can make it very challenging based off the tempo you are using. Number one, you could choose to have a constant tension variation. So constant tension just means we're not pausing at the top and we're not stopping at the bottom. We just have constant tension. Think about using a rep range like between 12 and 15 of those on each leg. The other option you can do, which is what I have most people do, is pause for a three count at the top. So you have, you come up, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, come down, back up, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. That is quite a bit of time under tension and it is absolutely horrible. Like 1.5, so 1.5, up, hold, and then you come back down, up, halfway, up, hold, and come down. That's just another version, but the hip thrusts are awesome. And by awesome, I mean they're miserable. Uh, this is a great way to build hamstring and your glute strength, and also like lower back as well. So what you're going to do is drive your heels into the wall. So right now I am pinned against the wall. My heels are driving in there. I'm getting feedback. I move the, move the, uh, the couch close to your body so it's pinned against your thighs. Have a slight bend in your knee. So you're not all the way locked out and hyperextend, but have a slight bend in your knee, okay? And what you're gonna do is you're going to hinge. So push your butt back. You have this for support, you have the wall for support. Push your butt back, drive your heels into the wall. Pause. When you keep pushing that butt back, pause and stand back up. Now, it's going to be challenging. What you can do as an alternative is you can have your hands there to guide you. And for some additional feedback, pause in that lengthened position stand back up again you're gonna feel it in your glutes but you'll know you're doing it right if you're driving those heels into the wall and you feel those hamstrings feel your glutes stand back up you can put your head hands behind your head pause in that position drive those heels into the wall pause come back up grow your booty grow your hammies make sure you put your pillows back so your partner is not upset with you Wow, we're back here. Okay, so you saw those exercises. You're gonna stick them into your program. Be sure to read the article that this video is for because I have a leg day sample program in there you could try out for yourself. Um, but for the most part, I'm just really glad that you're here. Really glad you're checking out the channel. Do me a favor. Uh, I think you can like, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, check it out because I'm gonna be putting out more videos like this and uh, leave a comment below. Let me know if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about nutrition stuff, or you're more interested in training things. I'll try to cover whatever you bring up. So comment which, what you'd like to see a video about and we'll see what I can do. And for the most part, there's nothing else I have to say. Just keep doing you, keep showing up, keep going. Because you're only one day away from getting back on track. You're only one day away from just realizing how awesome you are. Oh, that's really cold now.